thanks for coming. Uh, we're gonna have a hopefully an hour long walking tour, but it's just gonna be a, a short two block area that we're gonna be talking about today. So uh, not too much walking, but uh, just in this uh, small downtown area. And as a lot of you know, McFarland was founded in 1856 by William McFarland. And we're gonna talk more about William McFarland and the founding and the early railroad days a little later when we get down to the tracks. But right now I'm gonna start by talking about this little downtown area and, and how it's changed uh, from the very beginnings in 1856. And so for the first 30 years or so, this downtown commerce area was a lively area, but it looked quite different from it, it does now. Uh, most of the buildings were wooden framed, one story or two story buildings. There were a couple on Anthony Street facing uh, towards the uh, north. There were a couple wooden frame buildings across the street and and there were a couple more across the street there and so they all changed but it was really in the 1890s McFarland experienced the building boom where we're seeing some of the results even today uh, that the tavern across the street was built in 1897 uh, and then the Ole Olson building behind me uh, where the Lake Stone uh, property is now and the farmers insurance uh, that was built in 1897 and then the dentist office was also built in 1897 so at that time there's this big building boom and there was one other building that was built at the same time 1898 which is where the library stands now uh, that was the J.S. Johnson store uh, and it was torn down in 1967 to make way for the the McFarland State Bank. Uh, they're building a new bank office in 1968. And so we had four buildings, G.S. Johnson, the tavern, which we call historically the Evans Building, the Ole Olson Building, and the Taliff Lewis Building. Those were the four uh, main buildings in town in the 18, late 1890s. And then where the Spartan Pizza is, the, we call it the Ed Reed Building, that was built in 1910. So that was the heart and soul of McFarland's downtown. And uh, it didn't really change or grow much after that. But one thing that uh, happened, uh, this old building between the Ole Olson building and the Taliff Lewis building uh, was the McFarland State Bank. And it was constructed in 1904, opened in January of 1905. And so I always wonder why, why when they built the Ole Olson building and the Taliff Lewis building, was there a gap there? And uh, I guess I'm thinking there was a small wood frame building there. Uh, there were, if you look at the early plat maps, there was a shoemaker shop on this street. And I'm thinking that's probably where it was. The bank took over that spot and built their uh, new bank but it didn't look anything like it does right now. It was a very ornate, uh, very uh, beautiful small bank building. And uh, in the 1950s, in 1953, McFarland went through a modernization where they wanted the buildings to look new and sparkly and clean. So they put uh, wood siding on all of the buildings along here and uh, with a dark red varnish. And and then you can see remnants of it with the, uh, the old bank uh, at the uh, top. They've painted it a, a light tan, but that was the, the siding that they put on over the very beautiful, ornate uh, stonework. Is that stonework still under there? I don't think so, because if looking at the original photos, uh, the stonework looks like it comes out a little bit, and this wall looks pretty flush with the uh, Ole Olson building, so I'd be surprised if it's there, but it would be fun to go up there and check to see if it is. Uh, and the other thing too about the Taliff Lewis building, Ole Olson building and the Evans store, uh, architecturally they're all very similar. And so I'm guessing, I don't know for sure, but the, the same builder, the same architect was involved in all three buildings along with the J.S. Johnson store that is gone. But I have a photo. I just 
like to grab. We can pass it around. This shows the uh, original buildings with the bank in the middle and then how it looked in the in the uh, 1960s. Now pass this around. But it looks really it's, a, it's a 1960s. But as you look at this uh, picture, you'll notice a house on either side of these buildings. And there was a house where the McFarland uh, Museum is standing now. There was a house that was probably one of the uh, original wooden frame buildings in the main street in the late uh, 19th century. And then there was a house on the corner over here where this large apartment complex is. And that building, that house, actually stood where the Ole Olson building is now. And for some reason they felt like they needed to move the, that house across the street before they put up the uh, Ole Olson building. And I don't understand that either. Why didn't they build the Ole Olson building over there instead of moving the house? But those are some of the questions that probably won't ever be answered. Uh, the Taliff Lewis building, the, the dentist's office, I just mentioned Taliff Lewis a little bit. Uh, he was born here in 1865 and he died in McFarland in 1938. And for most of his adult life, he operated that, that out of that building. He was the uh, furniture uh, businessman, he was a barber, and he was the undertaker. And all of those kind of uh, go together, uh, if you think about it. He, he was building the coffins, he was a good woodworker, and uh, he was the barber and, and dealt with the uh, deceased too as before their uh, funerals. Uh, but also besides being a businessman, he was a farmer and he owned a farm down uh, Exchange Street on the corner of Exchange and Lewis Road. And of course Lewis Road is named after Taliff Lewis, as is uh, Lewis Park. And uh, other, a couple other streets, Lanny Lane and Rene Court, are named after uh, people in the Lewis family. But uh, he was a successful farmer, had uh, many acres, but he was more interested in being a businessman. And so he, he moved one block closer to downtown, but he, he was still on Exchange Street, uh, but on the corner of Rene Court and Exchange, he had his new house there and he rented out his farm uh, to another person so he could focus most of his time on his on his business but besides being a, a important business person in in town he was also a strong uh, member of the uh, the Lutheran Church and, a, and one of the top uh, givers and J.S. Johnson who uh, ran the grocery store here uh, or just a general store. He was born in McFarland on the Johnson Farm, which is on Johnson Street. Uh, the old farmhouse where he grew up is still there on the corner of Dennis and Johnson. And his father was sure uh, Johnson. And if you know Johnson Street, you're also aware of Sure Street that goes up to the grade school. So it was Sure Johnson was named after J.S. Johnson's father. Uh, again, Sure Johnson was one of the leading bus businessmen in McFarland and uh, just uh, again a strong civic-minded person uh, as most of these uh, businessmen were. Uh, the Evans store where the tavern is uh, was run by uh, brothers Ole and Egel Evans and uh, they, uh, Ole died in about 1912 and their brother-in-law Harold Smeadol uh, came into the business to take Ole's place and uh, Harold was uh, born in Norway but uh, when he was about 14 or 15 he got the America fever and immigrated to uh, the U.S. and he happened to have a, uh, a relative in the McFarland area so on his uh, tour around the Midwest trying to figure out where to live he was visiting a relative and then saw the uh, sister to the Evans brothers and fell in love and, and married her and so then became part of the uh, the ownership of the store and then the one brother Egel left the business and so Harold Smeadol was the only one running the store at the time but the interesting thing is this building was built in 1897 and Harold and uh, his wife were married in 1897 and just a few months after this building was up 
they had the wedding uh, reception and dance on the second floor. And undoubtedly, uh, there was music because Harold Smeadol was a fantastic uh, fiddler. He was an award-winning uh, Hardanger fiddler in Norway. He played for the royalty in Norway and toured all around. And so when he was in the U.S., he continued his uh, fiddle playing. And it was constant. People would uh, go by his house on a, on a Sunday morning and, and he'd just be sitting on the porch fiddling. But besides uh, being a musician, he was also interested in politics. And uh, he was involved in Robert LaFollette's uh, campaigns, including his presidential campaign in 1924. But um, in 1928, uh, William T. Evview, the publisher of the Capital Times, uh, encouraged Smeadol to run for Dane County Sheriff, which he did, and he, he won. And he won mostly by going around uh, campaigning and playing his fiddle. And a lot of the Norwegians in Dane County thought that was terrific and, and voted for him. But I don't know if he did such a poor job when he was sheriff, but he didn't win uh, re-election. But unfortunately, he was, uh, shortly after leaving office as uh, Dane County Sheriff, he was killed in a car accident. Um, and the uh, Ed Reed building, uh, just mentioned that for a short bit, that was built in 1910, but it also served as a uh, general store. Uh, the interesting thing is the Ole Olson building, Ed Reed building, J.S. Johnson building, and the Evans Brothers building were all basically in the same business, selling everything, uh, dry goods, uh, groceries, uh, hardware, anything. Uh, that a person would need could be found in any of those stores. And so it's hard to understand with uh, such a small town, you know, in the turn of the century, 1900, there were about 300 people here, but they had four or five general stores that kept everybody supplied in, in what they needed. You know, clothing, shoes, everything that you'd want could be purchased right here. Um, the McFarland State Bank uh, as I mentioned, uh, opened up in January 1905, and uh, it was started by local businessmen who felt they needed uh, a bank in town, and, and which they did, because it, now, today, it's easy to get into your car and drive into Madison or wherever to do your shopping or even banking or whatnot, but in McFarland, in the late 1800s, it was not easy or quick to go into Madison, and so they needed their own own bank. So uh, the top businessmen in, in McFarland got together and, and formed the bank. One of the early uh, uh, employees of the bank is Homer Vick Sr., and he started out when he was 15 years old and in, in about 1906. And when he retired in the early 1950s, uh, he retired as president of the bank. But he was the one who uh, you know, got the bank through the uh, Great Depression. And uh, also during the, uh, the gangster years, they were very proud to say that this bank was never robbed. And in fact, they, have, they uh, hired a, a group of uh, men in McFarland just to patrol the area uh, at night to make sure that the bank was safe. Are there any questions about the, that portion of the, yeah? Yeah, you mentioned that there was a big building boom in 1897, 1898. Do you know why that happened? I don't know why. Uh, and I, I don't know why they went from, it seemed like all of a sudden from wood to brick. If there had been a, a terrible fire or series of fires that they thought, well, we need, uh, we need brick buildings, uh, but, or the, the builder or the architect came into town and had a great deal for everybody. I'm not really sure why that happened, but it, it's curious. They were all at the same time. It certainly suggests more money. So it's more expensive to build a brick building than a wooden building. Yes, and so business is probably doing well. Yeah, in spite of uh, so many stores selling the same thing and, and such a small population, but the farmers would come in from, from the area and spend their money. Mm -hmm. Tornadoes too, right? They had to be concerned with tornadoes. Tornadoes, yes. Besides fire. Not that I've okay. I've heard of, uh, not in the past anyway. And you know, the recent one out, uh, Wabisa Heights, about 20 years ago or or so, 30 years ago. But uh, yeah, that would be another thing, the storms. 
they'd hold up better. Also, the brush color is the same for all the buildings. Yes. Is that the color of the day, or you know, no. I don't know. Yeah. And again, it, probably the same the same builder. You got a, a deal same on the same supplies. Yeah. I'm all just I'm just guessing. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. Same design. All the corners. The top is the same. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why the whole looks so odd. <laughs> and right. so it gives you an idea that it's the same same builder, same architect, whatnot. <laughs> so that car looks exactly the same as the old one in the photo. Wow. <laughs> About 50 but, years off. Okay. But the bank, uh, so it wanted to modernize like the other uh, buildings across and put in the, the siding and whatnot. And so, uh, in the late 50s, the, the bank purchased the Talaf Lewis building with uh, an idea of expanding uh, that direction. And at the same time, they purchased the house that was uh, located uh, to the right of the Talaf Lewis building. And in the early 60s, they, they tore down the house and their plan was to uh, expand. The bank was going to expand uh, to the north. and but instead uh, they put set their sight on on this block and so they bought the buildings here including the gs johnson store and the other building that was here and they tore them down in 1967 and put up the new bank in, in 1968 which served the community uh, for a number of years until the early 2000s and then they moved 100% uh, down to the highway I think the bank down on the highway opened in the 1990s at some time. I can't remember the exact date. But the other building that was here next to the J.S. Johnson store, right behind it here, uh, was the Autumn Thompson Garage. And uh, that was built in 1913 as a uh, Ford dealership. And so there's, they're selling the early uh, Ford cars right where you stand. And I'm going to try to find a photo of that. Well, before I do, here's a, here are a couple photos of the J.S. Johnson store that are where the library, where the library is standing. Sir, is it now, you, if a building is over 100 years old, do you have to get permission to tear it down or, or not in the Farland? No. Does it uh, Well, uh, there is a Landmarks Commission now and if, if the building is designated a local landmark, then, uh, then yeah, if anybody, uh, the owner of that landmark has to go through the Landmarks Commission for any, any changes. If, if they are getting a building permit yeah. to do any ex exterior change or alteration, they have to go through the Landmarks Commission. But just because it's 100 years old doesn't mean it's a landmark. Okay, that's not the only thing, but probably these are at this point. These are. The, the old bank is not a landmark uh, just because it's been changed so drastically. Uh, but uh, there's some other buildings, homes in McFarland that are over 100 years old that are not uh, local landmarks. And I don't have that uh, photo of the Autumn Thompson garage. So we'll do without that tonight. But just a, a, a quick uh, history of the Autumn Thompson garage. As I said, it's 1913. It was a Ford dealership. And it stayed that way until 1936 when one of the owners died and, and uh, Bert Autumn, who was remaining, didn't want to continue in the business by himself, so he sold it. But Bert Autumn uh, was an interesting character as well. Uh, before 1913, he was the first rural mail carrier in the McFarland area. And so he went out in horse and wagon uh, through the rural uh, countryside and delivered the mail. He did that for about 12 or 13 years. Uh, but he was also um, the first village president uh, he was on the uh, Board of Deacons at the Lutheran Church in McFarland. He was a Sunday school teacher for 13 years without uh, missing a, a Sunday. Uh, 
and uh, he ended up being the, the janitor at the McFarland grade school uh, until uh, he retired. So uh, after they moved out of the, uh, of the garage of the Ford dealership, it became uh, different things, including uh, the Wisconsin Conservation Department or the forerunner of the DNR uh, used this garage uh, a number of years, as did uh, J.H. Findorf, just to store some uh, equipment and whatnot. But it was uh, torn down in, in 1967. I should also mention in the J.S. Johnson store, two years before it was torn down, it was a pool hall. And so it was uh, the only pool hall in McFarland that, in the 1960s, but this, it was the hangout for the teenagers. Uh, we're just going to cross the street here and then cut across to the uh, Taliff Lewis building. Thank you. That's that building right there. Nope, this is the one that was, uh, was right torn down. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I found the photos of the uh, Autumn Thompson garage and uh, this top photo shows all the, the Ford cars out in front of the, uh, of the dealership. And then, that's this one around. And then this photo taken in the 1950s gives you an idea of what the building looked like. And that's, that's the garage in the 1950s. Um, but just one, one more thing about the Adam Thompson garage. Uh, it had a, a garage door in the center and then either side of the garage door were these big showroom windows like most car dealers would have just to show off the, the new models inside. And then sometime in the 1950s, uh, the, the windows were boarded up and uh, uh, local artist painted murals murals on it just to make it look a little nicer but uh, here as we're looking over towards Spartan Pizza uh, we talked about the Ed Reed building on the corner uh, but to the left of that uh, the Spartan Pizza portion that's only one story with a darker brick uh, that was that was built in uh, about the 1940s but prior to that, uh, there was a wood frame building, uh, the, the Scari Confectionery, uh, and it sold. There were two businesses there, uh, but uh, Scari had a, a confectionery where he sold candy and sweets and <clears throat> all sorts of good things. And in the picture I have, uh, there's a picture of a horse and wagon outside, and then in front of the uh, store are three. Uh, customers who are probably enjoying a candy bar or something but uh, and they have the coca-cola sign in in front but uh, that wood frame building uh, burned down in 1924 it uh, it had at that time uh, a grocer on on one side and a, and a uh, meat market on the other side and the uh, grocer lived upstairs and he could smell smoke and then when uh, he woke up at night discovered the fire got his family out and uh, rushed everybody uh, out of the other apartment and next door to it was a, a wooden house not that one but uh, an older one and that also burned down in the fire and living in that house that burned down was Homer Vick the the guy who uh, became president of the McFarland State Bank. And at the time he wasn't uh, the president, but he was a cashier working at the bank. And uh, his, uh, his wife and his six month old son escaped the fire and they had time to get most of their belongings out, uh, but they uh, lost the, the, the structure. But the interesting thing about that uh, was in 1920, four years prior to that, uh, Homer, Vic, and his family, and his wife lived at the first, at, at some apartments that were uh, the first grade school on the corner of Milwaukee and Broadhead. And they were converted into apartments in 1918. And in 1920, that building burned down as well, um, forcing Homer, Vic, and his wife to find another place to live. So they survived two fires, but uh, everything worked out in the, in the end for him. Uh, 
next, well, everybody knows the barber shop. And as the, the one picture being passed around, there is a, a photo of the barber shop, but with a different front to it. Uh, it used to have what they call a, a boomtown front, kind of like an old west style uh, building on the, you know, in an old west town uh, Main Street. Uh, but that was taken off maybe about 15, 20 years ago because it was, it was rotting and, and starting to fall apart. But that building was built over 100 years ago. It was 1902, uh, it's believed to be built. But at the time, it was not up at the street. It was behind the house that had burned down. And, uh, but it uh, wasn't damaged during the 1924 fire. Mm -hmm. You see that? And, uh, and so, while it was behind the house, it was used as a carpenter shop and as a tailor shop. And then uh, after the fire, it was brought up to the street level. And, uh, and since the 1940s, it's been a barber shop. And I think there have only been three primary barbers that have been there in, in the last 70 years, which is a pretty good streak. And then just uh, down the street, it's nothing to look at right now, but where the Frontier Telephone Company is, that's where the original McFarland Telephone Company was. But in 1906, it was started, but it was called the People's Telephone Company of Dane County. And uh, it continued for uh, until 1920, when August Yankee uh, purchased uh, the telephone company and, and changed the name to the McFarland Telephone Company. And from you know, the early days uh, to be able to call somebody if you had a phone in your house and you wanted to call a friend on the other side of town, there's no number to call. You'd have to crank the telephone and that would ring the operator who was in the building uh, that was located there. It was, an, it was another wood frame, two-story building and the operator was on, and the switchboard was on the main floor. The operator would uh, get your call and you tell her who you wanted to talk to and she would plug you into that person and, and ring that person up and then you could talk. And so it stayed that way for decades until the 1950s. Uh, it was 1955 when they switched over to a dial system where everybody got a, a, a telephone number. And so that's pretty amazing to think that to me the mid 50s isn't that long ago and we were still using the crank phone. But uh, August, unfortunately, August Yankee was killed in a, a car accident in February 1954. But his son took over the business, Harold Yankee, and then he uh, installed this new dial-in system. But it was still maybe for another five, six years where we had the party line system in McFarland, where a number of people on your street would have the same ring and so or the same number, and you'd pick up the the phone and you could hear somebody talking. It was maybe Hazel next door. And uh, if you needed to make a call, you have to, you'd have to wait until she got done with her conversation. And so that was just until about 1960 that the party line uh, system uh, went away. Oh, and there's the hand, hand crank phone. So that's, uh, I remember my grandparents having a phone like that uh, on the wall. And uh, just one very fast story, if I can tell the telephone story. So the operator would be sitting next to the front window and, and watching traffic go by as, as she's waiting for calls to come in. And in the 1940s during World War II, my dad was in the US Navy and uh, he got leave uh, from his ship. And uh, he, was, he wanted to call my mom who lived in McFarland and uh, so he called on a Sunday morning, and the operator, of course, uh, took the, the call, and he, he's, my dad said, I'd like to speak with Pauline Kulnis. And the operator said, no, you can't do that. I just saw the family drive by going to church. <laughs> so that's, that's a small town, uh, how things operated back then. And uh, just a couple of things regarding the post office. Uh, where the Spartan Pizza is now in that one level uh, part of part Spartan Pizza, that's where, that was the last place uh, the post office was before they had their own dedicated building. And it was 1960 that they moved around the corner 
uh, just behind uh, Spartan Pizza here, that uh, light brick building, uh, one, one story. That was the first uh, post office, the real post office in McFarland. Before that, the post office was located all over in different, different buildings, depending on <clears throat> who was the postmaster at the time. And that all depended on who was the president at the time and who got appointed. But uh, so it went from the J.S. Johnson store to the Tall F. Lewis store over there. And so finally, the federal government built their own uh, building. And then in the 1980s, it was moved over to where it is now located. And we mentioned the fire. And uh, the interesting thing about this fire that was uh, took care of the uh, Scarry building, the uh, fire department was just halfway uh, down the, oops, you got me. The first, the first fire department was just uh, halfway down this Anthony Street. Uh, even though the fire was half a block away, they, they couldn't do anything to save uh, this, this, uh, this fire because McFarland didn't have a water system until the 1940s. And so there weren't any fire hydrants. They had to bring the, the truck with the, the water in the truck uh, to put out the fire. And so it, it probably didn't have the really strong pressure to get to take care of a big fire. But uh, this is the uh, photo of the second fire station in McFarland. Uh, this building was torn down in 1960 when it was 100 years old. And so when it was first built, it wasn't a fire station because McFarland's fire department started in 1908. And so it was in one of the uh, general stores uh, in the downtown area. And it was converted to uh, a fire station in 1913. The first fire station in 1908 was right next door to it, but it was torn down when they put up the Autumn uh, Thompson garage. And in 1960, when that was torn down, the fire department moved to its current location, but it was a, a different building. It's gone through several uh, renovations since 1960. So we'll just uh, walk down this way a little bit. I'm going to show you this uh, house, uh, the Fortin uh, house. And at first it was located right here uh, where the Ole Olson building is. But as I mentioned earlier, it was moved across the street when this, when this building was put up. And uh, just a couple of things to say about the uh, Fortin house. O.O. Uh, o. Fortin was a, a, another prominent businessman in town, but it was his wife who, who did something uh, important. Uh, she was a member of the McFarland Lutheran Church and in 1875 she started the first uh, Ladies Aid Society or in in those days they called it the Kvindekforning Society which is Norwegian for Ladies Aid uh, and in those days they didn't meet at the church but they met in the women's homes and she was the first president of the Kvindekforning and uh, it was held in this house uh, right here. And then, uh, when it was moved across the street in the 1930s, uh, Mrs. Mann lived there, and she basically started McFarland's first library. Uh, she had uh, the Madison area traveling library uh, where she brought books into her home, and uh, she designated one of the rooms in her home as the library, and she had shelves and, and books lining the shelves, and so people in town could come up to her door, ring, ring the bell, and go in and help themselves to, to a book or two. So McFarland's first library isn't too far from its current library. Uh, the next story uh, is where basically the, the, the current post office is uh, right now, but uh, we're not going to walk over there because it's sunny and we'll stay in the shade. But that was the uh, Holton store, again, another general store in the area, and a wood frame, uh, two-story building. But it was nondescript, nothing uh, special about the store, but it was an event that took place there in 1902. And uh, it's the White Capers Caper, uh, where the Lewis Peterson was the proprietor in 1902. 
and he sold sandwiches, uh, cigarettes, uh, all sorts of tobacco, candy, uh, and malt fizz, which was uh, kind of like near beer. But like, um, McFarland was, was always a dry town until the 1930s. And so in 1902, you know, alcohol was not allowed to be served. Uh, but uh, people f felt like uh, that was uh, a den of iniquity over there and because they would see people going in uh, quite fine, but when they left a little while later, they were quite tipsy, not walking straight. And so in 1902, people got really riled up and they were having meetings against alcohol and against the sale and the drinking of alcohol. And the ironic thing, their meetings were held in the building over there which was, became the tavern but they were on the second floor where they had their meeting room and they were uh, just advocating uh, no more uh, alcohol and so they were getting all worked up about it but one of the guys who was getting all worked up had a grudge with uh, Lewis Peterson and so he thought well this is a great opportunity to do something to him and get back at him so he and six of his friends blackened their face with, I don't know, it was tar or coal or whatever, but they blackened their face and they put on white caps. And they went over, it was uh, May 8th, 1902, at 10.30 at night, and Lewis Peterson heard some noise outside, and so he just drew the, the curtain a little to the side when all, all of a sudden the door just is smashed in, and here come seven people carrying axes and, and revolvers and, and clubs and they start bashing the place, the smithereens, the, uh, the, the display counters, the, the furniture, and, and uh, they start roughing up uh, Lewis Peterson. And Lewis Peterson is knocked down, and he said that he feared for, that he was wounded because he looked down and he was sitting in a pool of something, and then he realized it wasn't blood, it, the spittoon had been knocked over. So he was uh, relieved by that. But uh, they took uh, Lewis Peterson and his wife and a customer and they threw him in the cellar hole and there they left him. And, uh, and then they, the, the seven uh, guys uh, left the store. But uh, Lewis Peterson was sometimes known as Lewis McFarland because William McFarland was his stepfather. And so uh, John McFarland, uh, his stepbrother, heard what happened and he ran to the depot uh, we, didn't, we didn't have a telephone system then, but we had the telegraph. So we went to the depot and telegraphed the sheriff to come and take care of the problem here. So the sheriff and his men come galloping in on horses. And it, and it's in the middle of the night. It's probably after midnight by the time they get here. And uh, so they get the, the uh, information from Lewis Peterson. And Lewis Peterson had a pretty good idea who did this because one of the men was uh, six foot four, and there probably weren't that many six foot four men, and a, a blackened face wasn't gonna uh, hide their identity. And the other man had uh, a huge uh, handlebar mustache. And, and another guy had a big wart behind his ear. So they were pretty sure who, who to go after, and so the sheriff went and got into one of the guy's homes right as he's washing off the black from his face. So he, he was uh, captured, you know, red-handed, more or less. And so that guy felt very badly about what had happened. So he just let the sheriff know everything, the whole plan and who all was involved. And so they, uh, they arrested all seven and took him to jail. And uh, they had to pay $75 each. And so in 1902, that's, that's a lot of money. And so it also went to court, uh, and while in court, the, uh, the, uh, the seven guys had a lawyer, and the lawyer was accusing Lewis Peterson of uh, running a, a, a terrible place, uh, uh, possibly prostitution and whatnot, and Lewis Peterson's wife was the head, head mistress of the whole thing. But finally, it was settled out of court, but the six men had to pay a total of $1,600 to the Petersons, which again, I'm sure those uh, seven guys did not have $1,600. But it was settled and unfortunately Lewis Peterson uh, left town. But the interesting thing is they, they beat up Lewis Peterson. He weighed 106 pounds. He was a former uh, 
a racehorse jockey. And so he wasn't a big guy, but he left town after the whole episode. And now we're going to walk down to the railroad. How much square feet is the McFarland house? Gosh, I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> All right. So we're standing across the street from the McFarland house, the oldest house in McFarland. It's 162 years old and uh, built in 1857 for William McFarland and his family. And William McFarland uh, came to the United States when he was 14. He was born in, uh, we're not quite sure if it was Liverpool or London, but his family uh, moved to England from Northern Ireland. And, uh, but at 14 he got on a, a ship and worked as a, a cabin boy uh, on his way over to Charleston, South Carolina. And while he was down south, he learned uh, the carpenter's trade and became quite good at it. But uh, he still wasn't uh, satisfied, so he came up north to Milwaukee, where he had a brother living. And there he got a job with the Milwaukee and Mississippi Railroad as a carpenter. And, uh, and it was just perfect timing because the Milwaukee and Mississippi Railroad was starting to build its line from Milwaukee to Madison. And uh, so William McFarland was on out uh, uh, helping to build the, the railroad. He was a carpenter, so he was uh, supervising uh, the builders of the various railroad trestles and any other wood uh, type of uh, thing that they needed on the railroad. So he's out there constantly on uh, helping build the railroad. And then uh, the interesting thing about the railroad, they, they wanted to uh, build uh, the, the, the tracks going from Milwaukee directly west to Madison. And, and that would have bypassed uh, this area. Uh, but for some reason, there are a lot of prominent or important people in Janesville and, and Milton at the time. And they convinced the railroad to come in a south westerly uh, direction from Milwaukee. And so they went down uh, through Waukesha, Whitewater, and then down into Milton and Janesville. And then from there, they said, go up to Madison. And because of that, they came through this area. And so by 1852, they had built the tracks all the way to Stoughton. And, uh, and then by 1853 and 1854, they started laying the tracks uh, through this area uh, going into Madison. And uh, it was quite the uh, operation going through the, the marshy land around here and, and crossing some of the lakes. Uh, in fact, they say that uh, tracks just east of here kept sinking into the marsh uh, because it wasn't solid enough. So they kept putting more fill into the uh, marshes so that they could finally get the tracks so that it would hold and the trains could go over. And so on May 23rd, 19, uh, 1854, the first train arrived in Madison, and it was a huge train full of you know, dignitaries, and it was probably uh, 20 some cars and hundreds of people uh, for this inaugural trip from Milwaukee to Madison. And in Madison, they had this tremendous uh, ceremony and just thousands of people lining the tracks watching the train. So that's, that train came through here before there was a McFarland. And so it stayed that way, that was 1854, but the railroad decided there was too big of a gap between Stoughton and Madison, so they needed a, needed a depot halfway between. And at the time, William McFarland gave his res resignation because he was tired of being away from home, uh, from his family for so long, working on the railroad. And, but he, they liked him so well that they offered him this deal, you know, come, come here, uh, put up the depot, buy 80 acres here and, and uh, sell off the land and, and, and form the town that you can name after yourself. And so William McFarland thought that was a great idea. So he came to town, built the depot, had the house built for him, and this is where he spent the rest of his, his life. And that's, those are where the tracks were at that time? Yeah. So he built the house purposely, like just a few feet from yes. the tracks. Yes. Okay. Yes. And and the house has served as a, a hotel, as sorts. Uh, and so people coming in on the on the train would 
stay overnight in the, in the McFarland house. Uh, and then across the street where we're standing now, there were two livery stables, one run by John McFarland and, and one by Frank Sigelko. Uh, and so that was important because people getting off the train needed transportation, uh, and so they would hire out a, a wagon to take them places. And, uh, and so it was uh, very important that the railroad became the heart and soul of McFarland. It was, of course, the reason why we're here, but everything that uh, McFarland people needed came in on the railroad, and everything that they wanted shipped would go out on the railroad. So it was a very important deal uh, for uh, people of McFarland. And so we're just going to cross the street if we can be careful, because there's no crosswalk. Well, the first depot was built right along here in 1857. And here's a photo of the first depot. It's on the left with an old uh, steam engine. Um, but it was uh, just, as I mentioned, just an important part of McFarland. And it was so important that when that, that depot was replaced with a larger one because of the traffic that uh, came through, the train traffic and the, and the amount of uh, cargo that was being brought in and sent out, we, they just needed a bigger depot. And so here's the uh, second depot. It was built in the same spot in 1881. The first depot then was moved uh, be, right where that uh, white back section of that building is. That's where the uh, first depot was, stood for another 80 years. It probably was torn down in the 1970s. Um, but freight train and passenger trains came through on a regular basis. Uh, it was probably in the 19, 1905 to 1925 where the train uh, traffic was at its peak for passenger service. Uh, during the summertime, nine to 10 trains would come through every day and drop off people who would go down to the lake for uh, for the summer. Uh, it was a major resort area for people from Rockford and Chicago and, and uh, even uh, southern Wisconsin. They would come up here uh, to use Lake Wabisa and, and, and the cottages here. And so again, then the, the, the livery stables were very important transporting people back and forth uh, to the cottages. And because the uh, railroad is so important, uh, the businesses then started springing up uh, around here as well. Not just the livery stables, but uh, uh, we had uh, the lumber yard where it's located right now it was the first business in McFarland. Uh, it was started by the Amy brothers. Uh, hard to Hard to explain how that started. They were here basically the same time William McFarland arrived. And so they were here on the ground floor. And so all of the building uh, that was being done, they were getting all the lumber from the McFarland uh, Lumber Company. And, uh, and then it, it's expanded across Milwaukee Street uh, in, the, in the 1970s and 80s. But for the most part, it's it stayed in the same location that it has since 1856. Uh, there was a grain elevator uh, in McFarland at one time, and uh, it's this building right here in the corner. So it's where the Chase Lumber uh, metal frame building is, the closest to us. That's probably where the grain elevator was. But uh, wheat farming was huge in Wisconsin in the 1850s and 1860s, and so the farmers brought their wheat into the grain elevator and uh, had a process there. And, so, and then it would go out on the trains. But uh, like all of Wisconsin, all of southern Wisconsin, wheat uh, declined in the 1870s because of bad economic times, but primarily because of the chinch bug that would uh, hurt, hurt the wheat crop. And so at, at that time, a guy named William Horde out of Fort Atkinson was promoting dairying as, as a way of farming. And so all through southern Wisconsin, including McFarland, that became the way of life for the farmers, uh, switching from wheat to dairying. Uh, 
And uh, with that, they started growing more corn and also tobacco. The tobacco became a huge crop in, in McFarland, uh, just as it was in Edgerton and Stoughton and Deerfield and Cambridge. This was a huge tobacco area. And so uh, tobacco warehouses were built uh, along the tracks as well. And, uh, and so it, it became just a, an important uh, area. And after the wheat went out and the, feed, uh, the grain elevator wasn't used, they still needed a feed mill for processing the corn and whatnot. And so that was located across the street, uh, just, just to the left of the uh, side track where all those Queen Anne's Lace flowers are now. Uh, the feed mill was there. So the farmers up through uh, into the 1960s were bringing a wagon full of corn to be uh, milled uh, here. And, uh, and then also on the corner of this uh, uh, exchange in Farwell, there was a little gas station in the 1920s. And uh, a guy named Arnold Larson, no relation to me, but he bought that gas station and then uh, he started expanding it. He was building, uh, he brought in oil tanks and whatnot and started uh, distributing oil there. And, and so he was, he was growing the business, but in 1936 there was a terrible storm and a bolt of lightning hit the gas station. Uh, luckily it didn't hit uh, the oil tank, because if it had, uh, the news report at the time said McFarland would have just been blown away. But the, the little gas station was burned down, but Arnold Larson uh, decided to continue uh, with his business, and so he erected this larger building, this brick building, it looked like almost like a fortress, uh, right on the corner. And so he was uh, expanding his uh, business and it became a regional company. He was an oil distributor and uh, he had 30 gas stations around uh, the Madison area and five restaurants. And uh, he had one restaurant in McFarland that was opened in 1959, and it's uh, where Angelo's is located. That was the, uh, uh, the Larson truck stop, or I guess the Badger truck stop, as they, they call it, because this was the Badger Petroleum uh, Company. And it eventually took up the whole block from, from here over to Taylor Road. The only thing that wasn't part of the Badger Petroleum was the feed mill. and. Uh, and it was the largest employer in McFarland. At the time, uh, he had 100 employees, and uh, a lot of them were truck drivers just, you know, delivering the oil. And, uh, but Arnold Larson sold the Smith Oil in 1965, and it went through uh, several hands, and then in 1954, it, it was uh, vacant and uh, condemned, and the buildings were, were torn down. And, uh, and once they got the, the contamination out of the soil because of so many years of being an oil uh, company. Uh, they made the park and named it after Arnold Larson, who was a, an important part of McFarland's uh, growth in, in those years. And he was a very uh, a big uh, philanthropist in McFarland uh, and, and big member of the uh, McFarland Lutheran Church. Uh, one the final thing that I like to talk about is the Edwards brothers. And uh, they had a hardware store, and they came to town in the 1890s as well. So again, another uh, big thing happening in the 1890s in McFarland. But they purchased a, a building, uh, that one there, uh, and then they added two more buildings to their, uh, their company. And they sold farm implements, and then uh, it, it grew to be all sorts of hardware, and then it grew into paints and whatnot. But uh, they had, you probably know, the little green building that stood on the corner there that was torn down a year ago. Uh, that was their office, but it also served as a harness shop. There were two front doors. If you went on the door on the left, you went into the hardware office, and you went on the door on the right, that was the harness shop. Uh, but the... the uh, the brothers, uh, Theodore and E.N., uh, came and, and started this business, and they also uh, bought the uh, livestock uh, pens from the Amy brothers, and the livestock pens are right here where the parking lot is. And uh, so they were 
uh, really growing their business and again the livestock uh, shipping was a big thing in McFarland uh, in the 1890s early 1900s and so they would ship the cattle and the hogs to uh, Chicago and then Oscar Meyer moved to Madison around 1919 and and little by little uh, the need for shipping uh, livestock to Chicago uh, diminished and so things are probably being trucked to uh, Oscar Meyer because it was so near. So the livestock pens disappeared over time. Uh, but the other interesting thing about the, well, E.N. and Theodore, E.N. left the business uh, quite early and then eventually uh, Theodore brought in his son Roger Edwards to uh, be in business with them, so it was Theo Edwards and son, and then eventually Roger was the sole uh, proprietor, and he sold in the late 1970s to the Bylers, who then moved the hardware store down uh, Farwell Street, and then and then uh, the Bylers sold it to uh, the current hardware store owner. So it's amazing that since the 1890s, there have only been three families that have been operating the, the hardware store business in McFarland. But uh, the other thing that the Edwards brothers were, were good at were building houses. Uh, E.N. Edwards had the uh, Larson house built just on the corner, and uh, Theodore built the house next door. Uh, but uh, as you look at the Larson house, it's very, you know, it, it's been restored beautifully by the McFarland Historical Society, and so it, it looks like how it probably did in 1898 when it was built. Uh, and that was E.N. and then his brother Theodore had the Deerson house, which is right next door, but it was even smaller than it is now. And so you could tell that E.N. was, or Theodore was a little more conservative with spending his money, and uh, Theodore was more ornate. But neither one stayed in those respective houses. Uh, Theodore moved up on the corner of Schur and uh, Exchange. Again, another fairly plain house but E.N. went further up exchange and built this three-story uh, Queen Anne uh, house that's still standing there. Yeah, uh -huh. and, but I, I don't know what was with E.N. He was not happy just s being still, and he left that house about three years after he had it built. And, uh, but he is the one who plotted out Edwards Park and uh, started the cottage industry down there. And uh, Theodore, of course, probably a little more conservative with his money, didn't want to get involved. But finally, uh, Ian uh, convinced his brother to come on down and, and help out. So Theodore Edwards went down there, and he's the responsible for the Brant Park uh, baseball diamonds because Theodore was a big baseball player, and he played down there uh, into his, 19, into his uh, 50s. And uh, E.N. Edwards finally uh, left McFarland altogether and uh, became a furrier in Madison. But um, there's some, just a few other things. The blacksmith shop that's standing over there, uh, it's a garage. That was built uh, around 1910. And the blacksmiths, of course, would take care of the horses and whatever else they needed to. But by the 1920s, uh, the Autumn Thompson Garage was selling more cars, and so there are fewer horses, and so the blacksmiths kind of uh, went away. And the dairy is just, uh, or the creamery is just further down uh, on the right, uh, right, right after the uh, entrance to the school, and that was around in the 1890s as well, and uh, and it stayed in business until uh, 1974. And those were the days uh, you know, they would deliver the milk right to your doorstep, and it was, it was great. Uh, and basically, that's that's McFarland history in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Any any questions? Yeah. Um. Oh no, you gotta think of it. Other put someone else go first. Okay. okay. Thanks. Yeah. I had heard that one of the early industries in McFarland was cutting ice for Chicago. They would put it in sawdust and put it on the train cars. Yeah. Was, was, was that really true? And how do you know any stories about how that worked in McFarland? Yeah, it was, it's true. It was a big industry. Um, and uh, they would have uh, big warehouses uh, along the lake where they would you know, saw blocks of ice out of the lake and then put them in the warehouse and then somehow keep the cool. I get those. Oh, great. Thanks. And uh, 
and ship them on the train uh, to Chicago for restaurants. And another big business was the carp fishing. Carp was a delicacy in New York City. And the fish caught in Lake Wabisa would be put in refrigerator cars and shipped out to New York. To, uh, I, I think uh, I've heard stories that there are menus in the New York restaurants that would advertise, uh, I don't know if it was Lake Wabisa carp or whatever, but it, it came from McFarland. The carp pens down in, on the lake. Uh, my, my knowledge of Edwards Park and all that isn't as good as some people, so I'm hoping somebody steps up and gives a walking tour of Edwards Park because that would be really great. And then I should mention too that uh, you know, Theod Ian Edwards built the Larson House, and it's called the Larson House not because, because well, there was John Larson who uh, bought it, but after Ian Edwards, it was uh, Talif Olson, a local farmer in the town of Dunn. He owned it for 10 years, and then John Larson bought it in 1911, and uh, and then it stayed in the Larson family until well, six years ago. So that's that's why it's called the Larson House because there are such longtime owners of it. Again, no relation to me. There are so many Larsons, but I'm not related to any of them except one back there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we have a, a parting gift if you're interested. Uh, you can each have one or just help yourself. They're uh, Wisconsin History Day by Day calendars. They're perpetual, so you can use it year after year. So they won't, they won't go out of style. <laughs> and uh, any other questions? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming.